Hi, I, my name is Kay Etheridge, and I'm thrilled as always to be here in the Oak Spring Garden Library. I've been coming here for over a decade, and every time I come, there's new discoveries to be made in this wonderful collection. And my area of scholarship has been Maria Sibylla Marion, who was born 377 years ago, and she was a groundbreaking biologist, and I even say ecologist. Uh, the word wasn't even invented then, but she made ecological compositions that connected plants and animals in a way that no one had ever done before. So I'm going to start the connections show here uh, by saying over here we've got work by her stepfather, who was uh, born in the 1600s. Marion was born in 1647. These large and beautiful watercolors are by her youngest daughter. She had two daughters, so she was mentored and trained by her stepfather. She mentored and trained her daughters. And then we'll talk later about uh, people that she influenced through the generations, even until today. She's had tremendous influence. So we'll start with this manuscript over here that was uh, made by her stepfather. Her father died when she was just a couple of years old, and her mother remarried, and Jacob Morell made these tulip books. They're called tulip books. And there's no text other than maybe the names of the tulips. And what they show are portraits, really, of valuable tulips during the period called tulip mania back in the Netherlands in the 1600s. And this large and beautiful flower shown here, this tulip bulb would have sold for about enough money to buy a middle class house in Amsterdam. They made so much money selling these that people thought they could make more money and they bred them and they collected them and this is just full of glorious hand painted images with the names of the tulips. What her stepfather did that was different and unique that you might want to see up close is this little painting, it's on vellum, and it has not only the flower, but something that most gardeners don't want to see with their flowers, which is a snail, which is going to eat that tulip. But as far as I've been able to find, Jakob Morell, Marian's stepfather, was the only person to include insects, spiders, and snails in with the actual tulips. As decorative elements, I don't know why he did it. They're just very charming. What we do know is that around the same time he was doing these, his stepdaughter was learning to paint and copied his work, most likely. And you may not be able to see it, but this tiny caterpillar is connected by a thread of silk to the tulip and to the leaf below. And she will later go on to picture this kind of relationship between plant and insect in her own work that she published herself. So you can sort of see her stepfather's influence in that when you look at her books that she published starting in 1679, she put insects with plants. But there's a huge difference. These insects are related ecologically to the plants that you see them on. If she shows a caterpillar with a plant, it means it ate that plant. It needed that plant to grow. Whereas other people just put them together for decoration. She put them together for biological linkage. And so you can see here, this is another example of why it's nice to have a big collection. You have an uncolored copy of the book or you can see the etching on the copper plates that she did herself, etched on copper and then printed on paper. And you can see a copy above that's been hand colored, not by Marion, but by someone who bought it after it was published. And this is how most books up until the 1900s were colored. They were colored by hand. And so the coloration varies tremendously from book to book. So a gentleman living in the Netherlands, the town of Middleburg, in 1756 started copying Marion's images from her books onto paper and painting them himself. We don't know why. We don't know much about him. He was a map maker and a bookseller and an artist, but he didn't publish this. He did it seemingly for his own enjoyment. But that's the beauty of a manuscript. You come, you find it, you ask questions, you can do research. He made a nice uh, title page for these. 
handwritten. So this has the date in the lower right, 1756. And he's copied Marion extensively throughout these manuscripts. He's even done the same image twice, and nowhere in there does he mention her name. So another mystery. So these are beautiful manuscripts that Oak Spring has. And another thing they have that's very unique are several paintings by her younger daughter, Johanna Harold. And these are exquisite. So you probably want to look at these up close. This peony on the right with daffodils behind it. And you can see her daughters were influenced because there's tiny little insects at the bottom. The beautiful tulips in the middle, again, you have insects decorating the plate. But her daughters were not biologists, and they did not, like their mother, put the same uh, ecological emphasis. They made decorative things that collectors bought, and these insects are there for decoration. The last one we have out today on the left has a moth and uh, up on the, the flower on the left and a caterpillar on the stalk and the pupa, the inert stage that's developing into the uh, moth on the, on the stalk. So it's, it's posed like their mother's work, but it's not for scientific content, it's for decoration. Now I'd like to make another connection, and this is between Marion's work and what came after her in terms of published work by other artists and naturalists. And there's a lot of this in Rachel Mellon's collection. And we have some nice examples here. So we have some published books and uh, by one author, an English author named Moses Harris. So Moses Harris uh, knew of Marion's work, of course, and he modeled his compositions after hers. And Oak Spring has two versions of this same 1794 edition. Uh, it's in French and in English, each, both of them are. And, uh, what Harris did was he arranged the insects with the host plant of the caterpillars, just as Marion did, except he didn't have to discover himself what they ate because all he had to do was read Marion and he could find out what they ate. So he could then feed them the right thing, raise them through metamorphosis and see all the stages and then picture them on a plant. These were some small group of the 11,000 insects that this collector, Drew Drury, had obsessively collected over years and he paid Moses Harris, an important artist, to paint them for him. Now Moses didn't paint all of them. What we have in this collection though is three of these bound albums and each has about 50 of these sheets. So about 150 of these beautiful images of insects. This dragonfly, you can see every vein on the wing of this dragonfly. And something I didn't mention before is that these insects were painted life-size. This is a swallowtail butterfly, and uh, the upper one, and he pictures it and all of these butterflies as if they're pinned onto a page or onto a, an insect collecting box. And he even paints a little shadow underneath them. So this isn't meant to look natural, like an ecological composition. But the swallowtail shows up in his own publication. So Moses Harris made the manuscript for someone who paid him a lot of money to do it. And then he made his own publication to disseminate knowledge about insects. And here is the swallowtail again. Plus here he included the different stages of caterpillar and pupa. And what's fun about some of these books to notice is there's an inscription at the bottom to a noble person. And you say, well, why is that? And every page has a different, uh, every plate, every colored image has a different benefactor's name. And what these are are people who donated to the publication of this book. These books cost a fortune to make and print. And most of these artists, naturalists, didn't have the money unless they got it from a benefactor. So they salute different people. And typically, the, the highest ranking person, it might be like the, the Prince of Wales, will have the first plate in the book. And it goes down in the hierarchy from there. So that's a fun fact. So let's just take this back to Marion. So let's link these swallowtails back to Marion. So here we have Marion's swallowtail. The first thing you notice is that this is a much smaller book and it would have cost a lot less to make this book. 
and Marion made her own plates, so she did not have to pay someone to etch the plate. Harris, I don't know if he did or not, he may have had to pay someone. But just the cost of the copper and the paper would have been much higher for this book where the pages are four times as large. So she self-published. She managed to come up with the money to publish her own work. So there are no names of patrons in her work. You can see that it's a much simpler composition, but it shows what you need to know. It shows that these uh, caterpillars eat fennel. That's the plant that it's on. And it shows the life cycle of the adult swallowtail the caterpillar and the pupa. So Marion published this in 1679. This was published over 100 years later in 1794. And she continues to influence even today.